look at you. Oh, aren't you glad you're not in a Yargos Lanthimos film, Daisy? Otherwise, you'd be a half lion, half dog. <laughs> Hey guys, this is Alachia, and this is my review for Poor Things. Poor Things is directed by Yargos Lanthimos and written by Tony McNamara, who also worked with him on The Favorite, and stars Emma Stone, Willem Dafoe, Mark Ruffalo, Rami Youssef. And it is a story that is based off of Alastair Gray's novel, loosely based. It is about a young woman named Bella Baxter's coming-of-age story. And man, does she come and come and come again. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Okay. So yes, it is the story of Bella Baxter. Uh, she is being raised by Willem Dafoe's character, Godwin Baxter, who is her quote unquote father, who tries to keep her in a very sheltered life. And he hires a young man named Max McCandles, played by Rami Youssef, to keep monitoring her, looking at her progress in development. And eventually he proposes to her to kind of keep her re remaining within the household and never really exploring life. Uh, of course, as they're drawing up a contract for this engagement to make sure that she stays contained, they hire a lawyer named Duncan Wedderburn, played by Mark Ruffalo, who offers to take her beyond her gilded cage and show her the world so that she can experience things for herself and figure out who she is. And the whole movie is basically her exploration of the life beyond her her protective world. And, you know, they even showcase how protective it is because her beautiful, lavish bedroom from top to, to from ceiling to floor is all literally like cushioned and padded. It's these beautiful quilts and everything. Uh, and it's just it kind of shows like she's literally been so protected that even like the floor she walks on is just pillows and softness. And... I found this movie really promising, and yet I had major, major issues with it. So I'm going to start off with the things that I found really great about this film, and then I'll talk about the things that I was vastly disappointed in. So first off, like I said, you know, the settings, the set, oh, absolutely beautiful well done that house the baxter house i was just like please tell me this is a real house it's not because it was just so gorgeous everything is just so delicate and intricate and just beautiful to look at and you know this this actually transcends throughout the entire film everything is just so well crafted the set design production and then let's let's just get into the costuming because that has to win the best oscar you know for the year I, it has to because the academy award goes to whoever designed these costumes they are the epitome of a combination of fantasy practicality uh, they demonstrate the fantastical elements of of the world that Yargos and or actually Tony McNamara built and they are uh, a combination of a Victorian style yet kind of like trimmed down and modified so that it has a kind of modern element which I think represents the the liberation of Bella Baxter from the sort of Victorian constraints. That was a massive theme that's going on here. And then, of course, to add to the fantastical element, you have this score, which is just perfect. It is just this combination of queerness and elegance and silliness and it has this combination of being fanciful and yet slightly disturbing, which really works. The acting, I mean, top notch across the board from Emma Stone, Rami Youssef, Willem Dafoe, Mark Ruffalo, everyone in this film performed at the highest level. Uh, it was like watching this really well-oiled Shakespearean troupe perform, and it was done in absolute synchronized unison and it just absolutely worked and i know that emma stone's getting a lot of accolades uh for people complimenting her on her bravery and putting herself out there and you know performing the o face about 25 times in the in the movie 
However, it's not that she was naked and exposed that I found, you know, powerful in the movie. It was her comedic timing. It was the movement, the physicality, the delivery uh, that Yargos and Emma Stone created together to make this almost like this Frankenstein doll come to life and be so funny. There's a scene where she discovers dancing and music and it's just the best ever. I, I mean, it's if it's the one scene, if I were going to rewatch this film, which I don't plan to, um, I would rewatch that particular scene because it is absolutely perfect. The styling of the film was also incredibly unique as I talked about how well the production design was. It seemed to be very heavily inspired by the 1902 trip to the moon um, and also kind of felt like the, the music video which was inspired from that, which was Tonight Tonight by Smashing Pumpkins. And, you know, it's a style that I think that a lot of people really want to delve into that kind of world. And it adds just that more elements to the fantasy, which I think really made this film deliver. And that unfortunately is where all of my praises come to an end. And I know I did just sing a ton of praises for this film. So people are going to be like, what are you talking about? You literally just said the acting was great. The directing's great. Production's great. Score is great. What more do you want? Well, story. <laughs> I absolutely am a huge fan of Yorgos Lanthimos. I watched The Killing of a Sacred Deer and was just blown away. So then I went and watched The Lobster and was like, this is incredible. And I just love the dry, dark, cynical flavor of Yargos and Ephthemus Filippu, which was his previous writer. And the favorite was kind of like the turn where you could kind of see it kind of go more optimistic and have that kind of lighter touch, which is the film where he stopped writing with uh, Filippo and then started writing with McNamara. Poor Things is the absolute turn into the bright, optimistic, fantasy level of a Yargos film, and I did not enjoy it. I kept waiting for the shoe to drop. I kept waiting for the cynical, punch. I kept waiting for the reality to hit these characters and it never did. And it was such a reductive look at what female liberation is. It, it is, it was so reductive in the realities of the pitfalls of a woman in stuck in an era or any reality in which she is repressed or oppressed. Just complete fantasy absolute fucking fantasy and I just did not like it. I hated it. I kept thinking, why is why am I watching an R-rated Disney princess film <laughs> from Yargos Lanthimos? This is not what I signed up for. I was absolutely disappointed and I want to go into spoilers so I'll go ahead and just give you my grade for the film now. I'm going to give Poor Things a C minus. Now, let me please explain before people get really upset because I know this is a darling film. My ultimate problem with this story was that it kept patting itself on the back for being a story about liberation. But if you look at Bella Baxter's story and you see what she goes through, you have to keep asking yourself, liberated from what? What was she actually liberated from? Did she actually experience oppression or repression? No. No, she actually li lived a very gilded, very spoiled life where everyone gave her everything she wanted and there were never any consequences to her actions. So the tale of Bella Baxter is actually very interesting and funny. It is the story of a woman who unalives herself on a bridge uh, carrying a child. And they're both semi alive, but not quite uh, when Godwin Baxter finds them. And so what he does as they're both about to die is he removes the brain of the unalived woman and takes the baby's brain and puts it in her head. And then he does this experiment where he tries to grow her 
and watches her brain develops within an adult body and acceleration and the development of the brain is incredibly accelerated. And so within a few years, she has already gone into puberty and she discovers self-satisfaction. And once she discovers self-satisfaction, she is no longer content to stay in her home. She's like, why would I want to do anything besides do things that make me happy, that give me pleasure? And if staying in my house doesn't give me pleasure anymore, I want to go outside of my house. And that's pretty much where she runs away with Wedderburn. And then they go on this kind of sexcapade in Lisbon and she discovers food that she loves and overeating to the excess of vomiting. And there are just zero consequences to anything she decides to do. Uh, she sleeps with a man however much she wants never concern of pregnancy, never concern of the pitfalls of childbirth during that era. Um, she eventually decides that she wants to move away from Wedderburn because she tires of him. And of course, instead of him tiring of her, he pines for her, right? Like, so yet this is another movie in which, oh, the man is just dying to be with the woman and the woman wants nothing to do with him, but he's just going to throw every resource he has in order to retain her. And it's just that absolute fantasy of a male who's just dying to do anything to retain uh, the, the love of a female, which is complete horseshit. And then, of course, once she's done with him, she wastes all of his money, uh, gives it away to the poor because at some point she discovers that there are people who are suffering outside of her class system. And so that's when the film kind of, again, pats itself on the back by saying, see, see, Bella has discovered what suffering is. And I'm like, no, she has not discovered what suffering is. She's discovered that there are people who are suffering. She is aware of suffering, but she herself has never and probably will never suffer. And these are like the themes that I kept seeing where I'm like, oh, yes, it just keeps going back into the fantasy element, keeps going back in the fantasy element where, you know, I don't need money. Who needs money? Who needs protection? Who needs anything? You know, I can have sex whenever I want. No consequences whatsoever. There are no such thing as venereal diseases in this fantasy land. And so then she doesn't need uh, Wedderburn anymore. And plus she's made him penniless. And so she's like, well, you know what I'm really good at and what I really like? I like to have sex. So you know what? I'm going to join a brothel and I'm going to make money in a brothel. And despite having to have sex with unpleasant looking men, none of them abuse her. None of them make her, in any sense of the word, suffer. And she just sort of accepts things as they are and she tries to make changes within the brothel so that women have more autonomy in choosing their johns and everything is la 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 great. And look, she's the, look at her bedroom. Look at her bedroom in this brothel. It's nicer than most people's bedrooms in the brothel. And you're just like, yes, of course. In this particular brothel that Bella has landed in, she gets to leisurely do things all day long because who knows, maybe her clientele is once every four to five hours. Surely she's not having to put out 25 times an hour like most prostitutes. So again, this fantasy element of the reality of the actual pitfalls that women who are seeking liberation suffer. And I kept looking at this, I kept watching it and going like, what the hell? Like, this is, when's this, when is, when is the actual pain going to start? When is the suffering going to start? And it never happens. She is always completely protected and insulated from any suffering. Everything just happens to go accordingly. And I just kept thinking to myself, in what fantasy world can you just declare your desires and wishes and get whatever you want, despite the fact that the people who are supposed to be preventing you from your desire and wishes are the people who make the laws, enforce the laws, who control the vast majority of how society works. And again, complete fantasy. And I don't know if that's what it was supposed to be. 
It was just a complete fantasy because, again, there are so many themes that kept being presented from the story that was about liberation, that was about just declaring the fact that you are liberated, therefore you are. Like, it's that easy for a woman just to be like, yes, I am I am free, and therefore I don't have to abide by any of these staunch rules. And it really just sort of underplays the actual hardships for women to have found and pushed for certain amounts of freedoms within society. As if saying, the only reason you don't have freedom or the only reason why you're not liberated is because you simply didn't ask for it, which again, bullshit. So I found Bella's journey just completely sappy, unrealistic, and kind of frustrating to watch. And I kept thinking to myself, what if it wasn't in this beautiful production design, right? With all these fantasy, trip to the moon, steampunkish elements around you. What if that costuming was crap? What if she's wearing a raggedy t-shirt and jeans? Or what if Emma Stone was ugly? You know, what if she wasn't pleasant to look at? Would you have enjoyed this film? Or is the only reason you would join this film because it was presented in such a beautiful package? And I feel like that's the problem with the film. It's just too beautiful. Poor things is more like rich things. And even things and elements that they talk about, which are things like general mutilation, uh, not just from Bella, but her father, uh, Godwin, as well as themes about trauma, and especially with Godwin, so much uh, idea of childhood and abuse just glossed over, uh, made to be sort of like these elements of comedy. And yet there are so many a- aspects that are absolutely very serious and quite dark, and yet, again, presented as this beautiful epic, sweeping, glorious, funny fantasy. And I just was not for it. And I know it's kind of selfish of me to have wanted a more, what I would call traditional Yorgos Lanthimos film uh, presented here when clearly I think everyone in this film was just having fun and enjoying themselves. But I feel like the topics and the themes uh, deserved a little bit more gravitas. I don't know. Again, I'm a killjoy. I'm very glad to learn that Yargos will be working with his previous writer, Ephthemus Filippou, on the next film. So hopefully there's a return to that kind of bitterness and the, the, you know, the bitingness and the cynicism that I enjoy from a Yargos film. I've never seen Dogtooth, but I think I'm going to go and watch that now because I need a palate cleanse from the sickly sweetness of this dish. All right, guys, let me know what you guys thought about Poor Things. I completely understand why people absolutely love this and that, you know, there's just this beauty to it and this sweet comedy and the excess and the fantasy elements and the girl boss and the you go girl, get it, slay it, you know, etc. elements are very powerful and people really enjoy that. Uh, But for me, it just wasn't the flavor I was looking for. All right, guys, thanks so much for watching. And if you'd like to watch more, you can click right here or right here to watch more now. Until next time, see you on the flip side.